So here we go again. We're now into the uh, open session question and answer um, part of the show. So we've got an hour now to do some other stuff. Hopefully something that hopefully something that involves playing because I was just talking for the whole of that last one. It's kind of nice to have a little bit of playing going on in these live shows rather than where is it? There's the middle. There we go. Rather than always just. Uh, just talking so uh okay intermediate question now or like it's not really intermediate it's any of that uh, can i talk about string bending i often catch the string above it with my finger okay so interestingly i've been refilming the uh blues lead series this week that's one of the projects that i've had on um and one of the things that i did was that string bending lesson uh, and that was a question that came up in the forum. So you're going to find a video, but it'll probably be a, a month or more before that comes out. Um, so the question is about that string noise. Now, if I just do a string bend, a really interesting way of kind of showing you what I mean is if I do a string bend, uh, but I don't use this hand at all, and I don't actually play the bend. So I just make the bend motion. You can hear some strings are bringing it. Okay, that's the fingers catching and plucking those other strings okay so it's really important to realize that that is done by the picking hand the picking hand is involved with doing that right so it's got a couple of jobs now most times string bear styling a little bit more gain actually so so um there we go there's a bit more bite to it um if you're doing a string bend, you generally want the sound, the, the bend to go up and stop. Okay, we, we normally don't want to hear too much of this coming down. Sometimes we want to bend up and down. But you can hear I'm not getting any string noise because this hand is getting involved, right? So learning to just bend up and then mute is also an important technique. So, okay, we're hearing the bend go up. We're not getting loads of noise there. Now, what's happening is this hand, after I've done the bend, is muting. I'm exaggerating it now. I don't normally bring my hand out like that. But that outside part of my palm is touching on the string. Okay? But because my hand should be sitting just above the strings, it's just this little movement. It's like half a centimeter. Okay? And you can use that all the time if you get into the habit of having that hand there. Now, sometimes I use the outside part of my thumb as well. Okay, so sometimes it's there. That thumb part might do a little mute on the string. But more times than not, it's this outside part. Now, uh, the fact that that should be sitting on the strings as well. So generally when I'm playing, I don't know if you can kind of see in there, it's hard to get the angle right. But that's it. If I'm playing... This this hand is sitting on the strings all the time. So they're muted by this hand. That note. Okay. See, all of these other strings are all muted by my hand while I'm playing on the thinnest ones. Okay, all the time. This is all muted, right? And then. So when I bend up and back. Now here, I've actually used my thumb, so my thumb is leaning on all of the strings to make sure that they're not going to, even if they get pulled down, thumb is just resting on all of the strings. So in fact, we'll try and get it nice and close like that so you can... Now here, that's this part. That's all covered. I can't can't see it in there. But it's that hand is sitting on the strings all the time, you know. And it's important to realise that most of the time when you're playing, this hand is going to be involved with muting. Gen the general rule, right, if you're playing any note, is the underneath of your finger is muting all of the strings underneath it. And this part of your hand is muting all of the strings above it and we usually use the tip of the first finger to mute the string that's next to it so as well when you're doing string bending 
can be helpful for the first finger. So fingers two and three are doing the string bend and the first finger is just, it's still on the string but it's more touching the next string. So yeah, it was just getting a bit noisy because it was uh, just about touching the, the fret. But it's really important that you realize you take all of those things away, you get those strings ringing out all the time. It always sounds, it's one of those things that sounds really beginnery when you get those open strings ringing out. So um, what I normally recommend for people is to stay aware, okay? Now, if you think about it too much, it can cause problems. If you're really trying to be all too careful about it, it's like overdoing it, overthinking it. So generally what I recommend is that you, you become aware of how to fix the problem, which is the underneath of the first finger and this hand and the tip of the first finger, right? So the combination of those three things in some sort of balance. And when you hear that it's a problem in your playing, then just think about it for a little bit. See if there's a way of doing it. See if you can make the mechanics work and then kind of just let it be for a bit and see if it fixes itself. Because for most people, most of the time it fixes itself. It's one of those things that I never learned and no one ever showed me what it was that was the technique. My body just figured out, oh, there's these notes ringing out which sound horrible, I need to stop doing that. You know, and, and we just had a question in the beginner hour about the importance of recording yourself. And that's one of those things where it's such a big deal um, to record yourself regularly so you can start to hear those things like you might not notice it when you're when you're in there and you're doing it for real you know hopefully your mind's somewhere else a bit and, and you're not thinking too much about it so uh you might not notice that kind of thing going on and recording yourself is a really really valuable uh tool for reflecting on what it is that you're playing very often you'll be pleasantly surprised as well you know that you'll play some stuff and listen back and go yeah it's not you know that's not bad I'm getting there, you know, and that's good for your confidence to feel like that, you know. And if you've got a shocking thing that you really notice that your time's really bad or you, you've got loads of string noise or your tone sucks or whatever, then at least you know now and you can go about fixing it because it's, which is better, much better than being blind to it, you know. Um, and that kind of relates back to a question that we had earlier as well uh, that I said I'd answer in this one, which is about my acoustic guitar pick guards. Um, actually, that, sorry, that one's not got it. Um, my pick guards on my acoustic guitars are covered in, it, it's actually Velcro, um, but it was just sticky material because I was doing a session, I um, can't remember who it was for, and, that, and they complained uh, that that I was getting loads of noise when I was playing. I'm like, what, what, what are you talking about? And I went into the control room and listened, and my fingernails were, as I was strumming, they were, when my fingernails would touch the pick guard, because my fingernails are plastic, they, they made this kind of tapping noise, which sounded really horrible. So. As a quick fix solution, the only thing I had in the studio was some Velcro. So I just cut some Velcro and stuck the Velcro and it fixed it straight away. So uh, most of my acoustic guitars have uh, some Velcro on there um, to stop that happening. Although since then I've kind of worked a bit more on my technique to stop my fingers touching on the on the, on the the pickguard unless I want it to. So I don't, uh, I don't have it all the time and I may not uh, replace the Velcro on those when it comes up, when it falls tells it so you know when it eventually falls off by itself um so that was a very good question there okay i'm going to come to the room for a little bit and see uh please explain jack white soloing style what makes it good and yet very very simple so okay um actually i've just stumbled i think i've answered a couple of your questions there coco but I'll, uh jack white uh is a very blues based kind of guy and uh a very a kind of guy who listens a lot instead of thinking that's my interpretation of it because i might not be right okay but when he plays he's really much more concerned with the sound and the feel than any of the other stuff right so if you really mean it and you honestly put your put your heart into it if you really put all of your emotion into what you're playing you can sometimes play some pretty bad stuff and it sounds good because people can relate back to that feeling and the feeling is more important than the notes are anyway, I think. You know, uh, when I listen to Neil Young play, you know, he means it so much. It's so powerful, even though he's not doing anything technical or clever or cool or complicated. It's got such weight to it that it really means something. And I think that meaning it is the key ingredient for the people no matter who they are the the really technical guys like eric johnson or whatever he really means it too it just happens that he means it his his 
he's got an, an, a next level of technique through which to mean stuff. So I don't think that he means it any less than Jack White. Just that Jack White has this very raw blues thing. He's not thinking too much. He's just playing and listening to what he's doing. And, and he's found a way of making that music very powerful, you know. And I think uh, much in the realm of kind of blues music. And I think, yeah, I think that's the trick. is just finding a way of expressing yourself and really meaning whatever it is that you're doing. And, and I think that's why it's important for all of us to respect other styles of stuff you know if, you, if you're a jazz musician playing some really complicated John Coltrane song where it's very intellectual but as long as you mean it then it's valid and, it, and it's the same as somebody playing a beautiful simple song as a singer songwriter like Neil Young is a good example I mean it's just it can be stunning but very very simple so I don't think I think it's important to remove that idea of complexity being important in music because it isn't I think the thing that's important is really meaning what it is that you're doing. You know, that's that's my take on it. Anyway. Um, OK, what club do you play in London? I'm not playing in London at the moment, but I'm trying to put together a band at the moment because it's my goal by the end of the year to have a, a regular residency somewhere. That's something that I'm really working on at the moment. So I've still not got my band together, but I've, I've put some... Uh, um, put some feelers out for some guys that I like to see if they're interested in in doing some work with me uh what do you do to dial in your amp for a gig uh, I don't, I, well it's a funny question i don't know i just turn it on and then fiddle with the knobs depending on what it sounds like you know because it's, it's different every time depending on what guitar i'm using or whether i'm after a clean sound or a dirty sound or whatever that can be it, it's uh different every time you know um uh okay why do you have an extra plectrum protection on the computer? Oh, that was that question. I answered that one already. Um, what do I think about using the first finger to mute the strings above? Oh, on string bending. That one. Okay, so I see people do that. Well, hey, that sounds cool. Couldn't do that if I tried again. Okay, I managed to get two notes from my string bend at all. Um, there's a lot of guys that use their first finger to mute all of the strings while they bend behind it. Now, it doesn't work for me, right? That's, it, it's just a personal thing, the way I play. It, it, it feels really weird to let the first finger go to, 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 while doing a string bend. I do think it's kind of a good idea. Like when I think about the logical benefit of doing so, I think it's, there's advantages to it. It seems to be mainly the rock guys that have got a lot of distortion going on that they have to tame. So it becomes, when you're playing with a lot of high gain sounds, you, or a high gain sound, not a lot of them at the same time probably, but when you're playing with a high gain sound, it becomes even more important to keep that string noise under control. So um, that would be the most common way to do it in a really high gain thing, especially if you haven't, if you're not able to do that, a lot of that muting I was just talking about. Um, I definitely think it's probably, a well, well, not probably. It is a valid technique, and there's some fantastic guitar players that use it. It just doesn't work for me, and because I don't use it, uh, I, I don't feel like I'm in a place where I could talk about how to do it. Uh, you know, it is just literally instead of using your three fingers like that, is using the first finger to cover the strings. You know, um, if you want to explore that, then you need to find a teacher that that uses that technique and ask them to explain about how they go about doing it. So, um, so uh, yeah. That would be my tip. Okay, uh, uh, Eva asks, uh, any tips for getting rid of excessive tension when playing, improving stamina and avoiding injuries? Okay, um, so uh, being relaxed is obviously really important and it's something actually, to tell the truth, it's something I battle with uh, when it comes to playing uh, long, fast kind of lines because I don't, I'm, I'm generally not into doing that much anymore there was a time in uh you know my uh, teens and late teens and 20s when i was really into doing like jose triani and that sort of style stuff and and i was learning a lot of that particularly the legato stuff because i don't practice it much anymore i now get quite tired doing it so if i i don't want to embarrass myself doing this style because it's not really my bag but if, if i'm doing as a legato exercise 
one of the things I'm thinking about while I'm doing that is trying to keep my arm relaxed, particularly here. I want my, for some reason, if I think about my elbow being loose and floppy, it seems to help the rest of my hand stay, stay relatively relaxed. I'm using a pretty low gain sound. Isn't it? But even if I do it like, if I just keep doing this, even though I'm trying to think about staying relaxed, I can feel the tension starting to build up already in my forearm. Yeah, okay, so now I've got the tension in my forearm already. Which I wouldn't say is good stamina. And it's starting to become to the point where I can really feel in my arm is tight. Now, that's not, a, I'm trying to give you an example that to, to show you that, you know, I don't, I don't have uh, incredible stamina in that, in, in that particular thing because I don't do it much. Okay, and this is kind of part of the key is if, if I did that exercise like that and I concentrate on staying relaxed, maybe I'd slow it down a little bit as well. But if I, if I did it consistently, I would find that I can do it for longer. And I know that because I have done that in the past with those kind of lines. Um, but because it's not the kind of playing that I do much anymore, it, 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 it becomes, uh, you know, the, the, the muscles that are involved with doing that become weaker, I guess. And, and, and uh, so if I was going to be doing some kind of thing like that, then I'd have to start practicing it again over a period of time. It's not like I can just do it once and then it'll come back. Um, but I don't tend to do that sort of, I don't like that kind of really long, uh, uh, kind of long fast lines anyway. I find them a little bit boring melodically personally. So I don't tend to play them. And, and as, as well, I don't find that I can hear them. And uh, one of the things that... Um, is becoming increasingly important for me as a guitar player is to try and play things that I can honestly and genuinely hear. And it's not something that I can turn on. And uh, today's probably not a good day to, to try and demonstrate that stuff because I've not played uh, guitar much today. I kind of had a day off and just spent it with my missus, really, to be honest. But uh, the uh, uh, on a day when I'm practicing and I've had a, a normal practice on, one of the, or well, one of some of the exercises I do are, are about trying to connect my ear and my hand together so that I'm really playing things that I can imagine the sound of um, and trying to link those things together. So I don't tend to hear those kind of long, fast lines very often. Um, and if I do, then it would just be a, a short burst of it. And, and I tend to hear it as a, a block anyway. It's very, very rare. Um, however, one thing that I do find really, uh, really useful that I do quite often is is playing uh, legato lines or pentatonic lines consistently with a metronome at a speed that's less because I find that one thing that I uh, I have f found technically unable to express myself a few times doing long kind of jazzy or blues lines that are consistent and long. So one thing I might do is, is put a metronome on. So uh, uh, if I get my metronome out. My Justin Guitar Time Trainer Metronome. You can buy it now on the App Store. <laughs> sell it, sell it, sell it. Um, so I've just set it at 120, maybe a bit slower. So I've just set my metronome at 100 BPM. So I might just start going. just sit there and try and play a continuous line that one was eighth notes right and I'm just I'm moving around the neck and I'm trying to find line. I'm trying to hear my way through the patterns and trying to look for some interesting ideas and then I might do the same thing with triplets so going <laughs> So I'd run around then with, with that triplet idea and I'm trying to 
train myself not to get worried about stuff and, and lurk and jerk and trying to stay in the pocket as well. So trying to keep my, my time solid on that idea as well, because I find sometimes on a long line, it's about relaxing and, and letting the line happen and, and trying to find where kind of, it sounds funny, but trying to guide my ear where to go and allow it not to become a panic. Um, of course, it happens again in a jazz kind of context as well. So I'd be doing a similar thing, but a lot slower, uh, maybe over some jazz changes. And I'd, I'd, I'd then go through and I'd experiment. 100 might be a little bit getting sticky for 16th notes, but I'll, I'll go through each different type subdivision. So I'd be doing 16th notes then and then groups of five, maybe. If I'm feeling a bit clever, I might do groups of five and definitely sixes. So um, this is, uh, yeah, that's kind of how it... Um, that's one of the exercises that I use for kind of stamina, but it's more more mental stamina um, than anything else. Um, hello, Manuel from Italy. Uh, say something about making scales musical when improvising. Okay, so that's that was kind of one of the things that I was talking about before. Uh, I think it's a really really important idea to get into listening um, when you're playing and not just relying on the fingers or finger shapes. It's about hearing the effect of what you're playing over something else, particularly when you're using scales, you know. Um, we've just got the same choices. I think using one finger is a really great, really, really great um, thing to be doing, uh, is, is to practice. You. I'm not sure how I can... I wonder what happens if I try and play a track out my computer. I can't play out the computer because then the microphone will feed back. Uh, so playing I don't think I'm going to be able to play over a backing track I need to do if somebody can remind me next week um, to try playing over a backing track and see if I can figure out how I'm going to do that the technology of doing that I'm sure I can I just need to figure out I might have to plug an external laptop another laptop into the Apollo that would probably work but um yeah, when, when, you're, when you're improvising, it's really important that you think about what it is that you're playing and keep, keep your ears open to hear what you're doing over the backing track. Okay, it's very easy as guitar players to get absorbed into this zone of just thinking about what you're doing. But actually, the listener hears what you're doing in the band or with the backing track or whatever it is that you, you know, the, the sum of the parts. And the listener doesn't care about you and your bit. They're listening to the whole thing. So I think that's a really important really important concept to get into your head when you're looking at, at making scales musical or making music is to try and learn to hear the scale and and hear what it is that you're playing over something else and whether that's a the right choice of of note at that time or not you know um i don't think well personally i can't say that i hear all the time because i don't there are definitely times when i'm playing and i've i've not heard um I've not been hearing anything in my head and I've had to rely on what I know. But none of those times I would put down as my greatest moments as a guitar player for certain, you know, where I've had to think my way through doing something instead of hearing or feeling my way through it. So, um, you know, we can't have it all the time. I much appreciate it when it, when it, when it happens. Um, record a loop would be great, but my loop is not plugged in and I don't want to interrupt the stream to set up my pedal board. I've just gone straight into this little Kemper thing today. Um, hello, Padriga. Hello, your girlfriend. Uh, Dunlop Tortex. No, it's a, uh, a Justin guitar pick available on my website, but it feels like a Tortex. It's called Grip X. I've been using these for a bit. I've been experimenting lately with my different picks. I'm using these jumbo jazz ones at the moment. This one's a uh, 0.88 uh, thickness, but you know, don't know. Uh, uh, thought Walk the Line was a great movie. I haven't seen it, but uh, well, have I have seen it. No, I don't think I have seen it. I should. Yes, I have trouble staying passionate. I'm hoping it's just because I'm trying to play with four in my arm. I don't know what that means. Uh, will you do any in-depth Elliot Smith style guitar uh, under Aiden? So I love Elliot Smith. I'm a massive fan. I'll probably do some more in the future, but I'm not sure how in depth I'll get with his particular style because he was quite unique and if you really want to study it you should get into doing transcribing but definitely on my list is like Angela's and uh, there's a few other tunes of his on my to-do list that aren't in the song books but just that I really love doing um, uh, 
talking about funk and stuff i've i've got a, i'm rewriting the funk course as well i've got a really i've written the the structure of a new funk module which will be coming sometime this year i've got a few other things to cross off first but i'll be doing that kind of thing uh talked about songwriting a bit in the last one if you want to go and check that out um do you think there should be a difference in the approach to acoustic and electric guitar i mean they're they're quite different instruments the um uh uh uh, electric and acoustic instruments are, are, are quite different in in how you would approach them, I guess. And 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 electric guitar's got a lot more things that you can do it sonically, uh, do with it sonically. So uh, yeah, the approach would be different, but it's not something I can. I mean, it should be pretty obvious how they how they're different. Um, okay, so the mods have just said IV is intravenous drip, not four. Uh, so I can't remember the question there. If you could help me out there, mods, and put that in, that would be great. Um, do I stick with one plectrum size? When would you change it? So I used uh, Dunlop Jazz 3s for 15 years. I was using the same pick. And uh, my friend Dario, uh, uh, when I was doing this workshop with him in Tuscany last year, he had these bigger, um, uh, bigger size Jazz 3s, but they weren't by Jim Dunlop. They were by someone else. I can't remember who they were. Um, he had the purple one, which I've got the small purple, uh, like Jazz 3 size, but it's made of Tortex instead of being the Tor the Jim Dunlop, the, the Jazz 3 material. And I, and I quite liked, I liked the feeling of the Tortex material, but in a Jazz 3 shape. I was really enjoying that. Uh, so I changed to this for a little while, the purple, purple Jazz 3 one. Justin Guitar Picks are available on the JustinGuitarStore.com. Got to put my little sales pitch in there at some point i guess uh, and then i started mucking around with the big one as well just because i've been exploring picking lately um uh some of you may know this this website called cracking the code uh, and troy grady uh if you've not gone and checked it out before i definitely a uh, big recommendation there for troy because he's really nice nice guy and a really thorough researcher and he's been doing a lot of research into how picking works into the the mechanics of, of guitar picking and it's changed how I pick a little bit. So uh, I always just used to think like up and down. Now I think an in and out. So uh, it, it's changed. I'm thinking much more like this these days, in and out, instead of up and down like this. I'm thinking up, you know, this kind of thing. And uh, I'm still working on it. So I'm not doing lessons on it because I'm still trying to figure out how the technique fits into my own playing. And, and I don't want to try teaching you stuff that I don't understand properly. But um, uh yeah, so that's uh, that because of that. That's why I kind of moved to using the bigger pick because it felt a little bit easier to do this kind of in and out thing uh, with the bigger pick. So that's the only reason I've changed. I wouldn't if if I'm doing serious guitar playing at the moment. I'm still kind of going for the smaller jazz three uh, shape, uh, but in this Tortex, the purple Tortexy material called Gripex. That's what I've kind of moved to um, at the moment. But I do I. I don't change that much, a little bit. Um, so, uh, I finished the beginner's course using the first guitar acoustic that I bought. Any advice on buying a second guitar? I'm thinking of electric notes, uh, my first of the worst. So if you're buying a new guitar, really big deal is going to the store and playing a few, right? So that's, I can't emphasize it enough. Trying to listen to somebody else to say, um, you know, uh, uh, that you, that you uh, what guitar should I buy? I mean, I don't know what sort of guitar you should buy. Nobody does except you. You know, you've got to go to a store and try them out. You know, it's a, it's a really important part of, 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 of the journey is trying to find the right one. You know, there's, I mean, there's some, uh, I'm just trying to think like that. I, I did buy a brand new guitar recently, which was this, uh, I don't know where it is now, a, a, a Fender Jazz Bass, right? Because I needed a new bass guitar. I've got a couple of vintage ones and they were getting really crackly and I wanted one that I could rely on when my vintage ones weren't working properly. And I asked around all my bass player friends and they all said, you know, you can't go too wrong if you get yourself a, a, a Fender Jazz or a Fender P Bass, either one, depending on what you like. But I like the idea of the Jazz one. So I bought one online but knowing that I was probably going to spend a bit of time doing it up and that there wouldn't be too much that could go wrong with it, you know, when it came out of the box, it's a pretty standard kind of a guitar. Those, you know, Fender Strats as well. You know, if you get a Fender USA Strat, you're probably not going to go too wrong because the build quality is generally really good. 
and you can start mucking around with it. Very rarely do I buy a guitar and keep it the same as it comes. You know, I fiddle about with them and I adjust the action or I give it to Charlie to, to put it into the Plec machine, which is this special machine that makes the, the, uh, the setup of the guitar really good. Um, but it's very likely I'm going to change pickups and I might change the saddles into, I haven't changed them on this one yet, but I almost certainly will change them for the little Teflon saddles and stuff. Um, so, it, you know, it is okay to buy online, but generally, if you've got to buy a new guitar, then I would recommend that you go uh, to the store and you try out guitars and try and find the ones that you feel a connection with. I know when, when I went to buy this very instrument, um, I went to the the store that, um, I can't remember what it's called now, in, in, uh, in Epsom, and uh, they had quite a few of these, and I spent like three or four hours trying the different ones, and some of the ones that in fact the one that if i had bought it online the one that i liked and i can't remember what it was that i liked about it maybe it was just the color but um it isn't the one that i would have bought if uh, when i went to the shop and i started playing them all uh this one felt loads better than the other ones they had like four or five sir strats with a humbucker single single you know and i had to go and try them and see which one was the one that felt nice to me you know and and after a little while, I started going, yeah, that one doesn't work. No, this one doesn't work. And and then I settled on this, you know. So I think going to going to the shop is a really big deal. And you shouldn't ask too much about other people, what other people think. You should um, try them yourself. Um, please do lessons on soloing over chords. There are, uh, it depends on what sort of lessons you're looking for there. If you're talking about playing chord changes like jazz, I'm, I've got a, a jazz lead guitar. Basically what's happened. I've, I've got a new system coming soon for the website, which is not finished yet, so I don't want to talk about it too much, but I've redesigned some of the modules, like the funk module has been redone, the jazz rhythm guitar one is kind of new, but uses some of the old lessons a little bit. I've got a jazz walk and bass one, um, can't remember if I said funk, but the funk one is done as well. I've, I've redone blues lead guitar one, blues lead guitar two, there's now a blues lead guitar three, um, I've done got a classical basics one. I've got all of these wonderful little modules coming up, um, of which I'm 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 in quite I'm feeling quite inspired at the moment, and I'm redoing a lot of that stuff. So, uh, Master of the Major Scale is another one where it's there's going to be some more online content, but there's going to be another DVD that goes with it as well. There's a modes one. I've 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 got them written out, and and they're most of the material is kind of written for them now because I spent a lot of time. I'm quite nerdy about organizing stuff and I really wanted to give all of you guys a good pathway because I think it's it's difficult on the internet the way that the internet is now there's loads of licks and stuff everywhere and I wanted to kind of get things organized for you guys so I've 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 got some really awesome stuff coming out for you that guys this year it's going to be very exciting but um yeah it's definitely coming um whatever happened to that custom made acoustic guitar haven't seen it in any lessons so the jester is uh the Jester is in my storage lockup with all my other guitars, um, I think, or it might be at home. No, I think it's at my storage place, um, just because I like the sound of this Michael Fix better. You know, I, I, uh, it plays a bit nicer and the sound is a little bit stronger. I, I like the the depth of the sound a little bit more. I love that the the Jester; it's beautiful. But it, that's you know, um, what sort of stuff should you play while in a guitar store? Well, you should play what you want, not give a shit what anyone else thinks about what you're doing right and which is hard i find it difficult because if i go into a guitar store invariably there's somebody there who's used my lessons or knows what i'm, I'm doing so if i start playing really badly that you know they're probably gonna start slagging me off but um uh you know uh i think it's a good idea to have some party pieces to play in a store actually but it's kind of you should have party pieces to play just generally you know um uh so I've, I've still got a bunch of party pieces that if I had to play somewhere, suddenly I, somebody's given me a guitar, there are certain things that I'm more likely to play because they're, especially if I'm not warmed up, you know, that, that if I uh, happen upon a guitar store and if I'm out and about or whatever, uh, you know, I've probably not practiced much that day and I'm, you know, uh, yeah, that's the, that's the, the situation there. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so get, develop some party pieces to play in shop, sure, but it's mainly for you because you want to be. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. But if you're if you're in the in the stores there, you need to 
have some things to compare different guitars with in different circumstances. So that's the other advantage of having the party pieces. Um, okay, uh, close to you just said it means the French made. Okay, so the French made, uh, made by my friend Richard, um, that is also in my storage locker right now, just simply because my studio here, my the studio I'm currently in is very small. I went from having a fantastic studio where I had all of my gear all in the same studio. And then when that closed and I moved to another studio, I took all my stuff with me, but that studio was really terrible and uh, I had a really bad time there generally. So most of my stuff didn't get unpacked and then it went back to the storage locker and I've moved into the room I'm currently in, which is quite small. And I've only got like five guitars here. So I've got this one, I've got my 335, my, tele uh, my old Telecaster, um, the Fender P bass, the Maiden Messiah, amazing acoustic guitar, which is I, my primary recording guitar and the Michael Fix acoustic guitar. And that's all I've got here. So uh, the beautiful guitar from Richard is currently in, in a locker, which is a real shame because it's a beautiful instrument, but it, it's uh, not got the consistency for me of the uh, of this uh, this this uh, Michael Fix jobby, which is just kind of easier to play. Uh, yeah, it's easier to play, I guess, is the main the main reason um do i name my guitars yes all my guitars are named um uh, i don't generally tell other people what their names are though because it's kind of between me and them uh but they often have nicknames which i used to share with my old guitar tech he knew the names of most of my guitars but most of them are just like you know this one's fixie over here the michael fix model is called fixie you know the messiah was called messy so they had nicknames on the, on the road um uh better amp or another pedal uh hmm, depends if your amp's no good then get another amp because an amp, amps are for, for tone amp is really like most of it so the way i kind of see it is uh the guitar is the connection that i've got to get the music out from right so for me the most important thing about a, a guitar is how it feels to me how it feels in my hand how how it yeah, just whether it connects with me, right? And that's why I'm saying it's really important that you go to the store and you try the instrument because you want to feel like it connects with, with you. And this, this guitar, for me, it, it connects beautifully. I love the feeling of the neck and the, there's no sharp bits on the frets and it just feels nice for me to play it, you know. So, but when it comes to the sound, more important is the, is the amp. The amp is much more about where the tone comes from than the guitar. You know, if you've got, and a, and a good way of telling that is if you take, if you go to a guitar store and you take like the cheapest ever guitar and you plug it into an incredibly expensive amplifier, it's going to sound good, right? Whereas if you take the most expensive guitar in the store and plug it into the cheapest amp, it's going to sound rubbish. Whatever you plug into a rubbish amp sounds rubbish, right? So that's proof of the pudding, you know, is that, um, you know, you want to try and get yourself as best an amp as you can. And, and uh, yeah, I really like, I'm really into amps, generally speaking. I've, I've, I've nearly always played Fender amps, and I, I love Fender amps generally more than other type of amps. Um, lately, I've been playing a lot through an amp called a Lazy J, um, which is kind of a high-end boutique amp. Uh, uh, British made amplifier which I love that Lazy J it's a fantastic amplifier one of definitely one of the finest that I've ever owned um, and uh, so I'm, I'm using that the most at the moment but I've also got a Fender is it called ProSonic? No, Super Champ it's the one that I've got here which is a an older all valve uh, it's not the current Fender Super Champ which I'm not that keen on um, but the old Super Champ is fantastic um, yeah, I've got, I've, you know, I, I love the Sir amps as well. The Sir Badger 30 is one that I really like. Uh, one that I haven't got that I would really like is an Imperial. Um, uh, that's just a, a yeah. Uh, Martin Offley and my friend Richard Bennett used this thing, the Tone King Imperial. And uh, I don't have one, but I would definitely like one of those, another combo amplifier. Uh, still got 20 minutes left. Um, somebody asking that. Uh, what rig can you get? For small price for first gigs and I mean just a combo a nice valve combo I, I always recommend for people who are looking for an amp that don't want to spend a lot of money but want a really good quality amp is the Fender Blues Junior I think for bang for buck that's a fantastic valve amp to start out with if you if you're just getting into your first valve amplifier you know it doesn't have anything fancy on it but it takes pedals real great so you're going to have a really good kind of starting point, a great valve clean sound that you can then build on. And like I said, it takes pedals really well. So 
Uh, some amps take some pedals better than others, so you need to find the ones, the pedals that work really well for that. But that's a, I think that's a good standard, uh, standard great valve amplifier would be a Blues Junior. Um, that's the that's the thing that I would recommend. Um, uh, thanks, Clemente. Thanks for joining us. Uh, the PT100 amp would be fantastic. I know Pete Thorne as well. He's a great, great guitar player and a nice guy. I should check it out, but it's a kind of an expensive amp to just get to check out, you know. Um, it's not like I just ring up Sir and he'll just send me one. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't work like that. Unfortunately, I wish it did. Um, could you do a video on gear you use, pedal board, etc., like Marty Swartz done a while ago? Um, yeah, I've got, in fact, I've got a new pedal board. Uh, it's just it's not plugged in at the moment because I've been lazy and just plugged into this little Kemper thing. But um, it's an awesome pedal board. It's based around the the G pedal uh, the uh, gig rig G two uh, system. It's incredible. Um, so uh, uh, I need to spend a bit more time with it before I do because I need to sort my tone out before I go. Hey, listen to my pedal board. How awesome it is. You know, I want to make sure that I'm 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 ha I'm happy that it's awesome. You know, um, and I still need to do it because it's a new rig you know and i'm still fiddling around with the the even tide h9 and the timeline and getting the midi to all sync up and all of that stuff you know so yes i will do some of that at some point um uh do i know any quick blues riffs i mean uh i've got a great lesson on making up your own blues riffs maybe you would like you would enjoy that um do you still use the dots on the guitar neck for reference? Yes. And it's an interesting uh, point. When I was studying guitar at the, at the Guitar Institute and I was getting really into fusion and, and, uh, and jazz and jazz fusion, I bought a Parker Fly guitar. And the whole reason I bought the guitar was it didn't have any dots anywhere on it. And I thought that it would help me uh, develop a relationship between just the sounds that I was thinking about. And uh, for that, it is really good in that it, 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 it stopped me from thinking about what the note was. Because when you've got dots on, I can't help but see, oh, that's an E, and if I go there, it's a G, and if I go there, it's an F sharp, whatever. I, I know straight away what the note is that I'm playing. And if I know what the chords are, my brain just can't help but start making a relationship between those two things. So um, I get over that now by closing my eyes. So often when I'm playing, especially if I'm doing... Uh, for those of you who don't know this exercise, you should definitely check it out. But just trying to play uh, melodies to songs that you know without knowing where you are. So just putting your hand on the fingerboard and just tr start trying to play a song, the, any melody that you know very well. Um, it's a really good exercise on developing that relationship between things that you can hear in your head and, the, and your hands. Um, so when I'm doing that, I don't very often look at the fingerboard because I don't want to start falling into the trap of thinking about what the notes are. So there is an advantage to doing that. But if I'm jumping around on the fingerboard, I definitely want the dots because I still use them for reference all the time. It, you know, so I think it's a, it's a blessing and a curse, but it's a, the, the, the curse of knowing what the notes are is very easily solved by just not looking at the fingerboard. So I'd rather have, uh, uh, rather have them on there. Um, uh, do you prefer noiseless or standard single coils? Um, uh, noise, well, uh, I'm trying to think. I've got noiseless pickups in my red Stratocaster. They're noiseless, which I kind of need in, in this particular studio. We've got a problem here with uh, noise coming through. There's a train line at the back of, there's another studio behind me. And then behind that, there's a train line. And the electricity from the train line causes problems with the pickups. It's a big problem for me at the moment because I'm supposed to be working on a on a guitar record, but I can't record rec guitars here. I'm recording demos, but I can't record the actual guitar parts because I've got all this blinking noise coming into the pickup. So I have to use humbuckers and at the moment or noiseless pickups. I can't use regular single coils. The Telecaster I haven't been touching lately because it just sounds really noisy. So um, yeah, that's uh, uh, but so yeah. So I don't really, uh, I've got guitars with both noiseless and, and regular single coils, and I like both. Both have the, the um, you know, the same sort of things. Um, uh, can you teach us some U2 or Cult uh, and some more Bowie? I'd definitely be doing some more Bowie. Uh, I love the Cult. Funnily enough, I was just, uh, in fact, I'm going to make another note of it because I don't know where. I had a blackboard with a bunch of ideas of stuff, of songs to do. And the Cult came up again as being great power chord songs because I don't have enough great um, power chord songs on my site. So, so Wildflower was one that I 
remember from my teenage years playing. I love that that whole electric album by the cult was that was the bang man. Um, yeah, I'll definitely be doing some more Bowie. I've got um, uh, uh, Life on Mars. I've just finished transcribing Life on Mars, trying to do a slightly uh, useful kind of guitar arrangement rather than just show you the chords. So I need to do a bit of work on that. Um, very sad, obviously, the whole Bowie thing is. Um, I, feel, I, I can listen to Bowie again now. It took me a few days before, you know, I just didn't uh, didn't feel up for listening. I found it really difficult. The whole Bowie dying thing wasn't wasn't good at all. Very sad. Great great loss. Um, incredible musician. But I'm back being able to enjoy his music again, which is nice. Um, so uh, the wah that I use, I don't, I don't have a wah on my pedal board right now, actually. Um, I don't use wah a whole lot, but the one that I use is a, uh, the Buddha Bud wah. That's the, the one that I use mostly at the moment. Um, I can't show you the rest of the studio right now because you're plugged into a laptop. But the, the camera I'm using is my laptop and it's I've got like this hub of cables that are c connected to the rest of the studio and the laptop and I can't really move it around. So uh, when I figure out a better way to do it and when I get the, the studio tidied up, maybe I'll do a tour of the, the studio with, a, with another uh, camera. But that's why I'm not showing you the studio right now because, well, just told you. Um, uh favorite bowie song <laughs> black star now i think it's absolutely incredible um yeah that's a yeah unbelievable song so it's my new favorite bowie song um floating versus set pick up on an arch top i don't know um i've only just got an arch top recently a 175 and that's fixed pickup so i'm not really sure i don't have an opinion on that i'm afraid uh we don't appreciate until people are gone sometimes yeah true enough True enough. Same with Lemmy. You know, I used to love Motorhead when I was a kid. Loved Motorhead. You know, I had a Motorhead t-shirt and I used to draw, my friend used to draw an Ace of Spades with the Born to Lose, Live to Win thing. Uh, you know, I used to draw it on my arm with a texter. But I hadn't listened to Motorhead for quite some time. And uh, yeah, it's funny. When, when he left, it was really, I really felt it. It was it was quite strong, you know. I I had a bit of a cry watching his funeral and stuff. And it's like, I never knew the guy, man. You know, it's just, it's very weird how we build these relationships with people. Um, even though we don't know the music being such an amazing bonding thing that, that uh, I really felt like I knew him, but I didn't at all. Very weird. Anyway, let's not talk about this death stuff because it's not, yeah, it's not something that we should, you know, <laughs> trying to have a nice upbeat Saturday night you know, Q and A chat show thingy, and uh, you know. um, so anyway, uh, any chance of bringing back Mike Dawes? Almost certainly. Uh, Mike was at my house a couple of weeks ago, just before he went on. A, he's on tour in the U.S. at the moment. We had a really nice hangar. We were talking about doing that. So uh, almost certainly, one of the things that uh, if this show uh, continues to do well, looks like it's still staying very popular, and, and it's getting more fun now with uh, now that we've got rid of the idiots with the moderators. Thank you very much, mods. Um, uh, yeah, I'm planning on continuing this and I'm going to hopefully get some more guests uh, on and uh, definitely Michael will be probably up for it if uh, if he does. Uh, so I was talking about um, uh, uh, jazz chord melody arrangements. I've got a set that I'm working on. So that's the thing about jazz chord arrangements is it's something that I'm working on myself personally. So I, I'm, I'm trying to be careful about not doing too many things that I'm not, I don't feel comfortable with as you know doing uh but i love doing jazz arrangements and i've got a few on the on the cards and i'm trying to turn it into a course i just need to think about more um uh yeah more, more about doing that sort of stuff so um uh having how about having brian may as a guest that would be incredible to have brian may as a guest but i think that's kind of a difficult thing i'm not sure brian wants to come to my little studio in acton you know probably a pretty busy guy um uh do you like joe walsh love joe walsh incredible guitar player um, any more ebooks on the way? Yes, I've nearly finished a book on reading standard notation uh, that I've co-written with my friend Dario Cortese. That will be coming out as a paper version and as a uh, PDF ebook. Um, the next thing that will be happening is I've got a, a new music theory expanded thing. Uh, it's not an ebook, but it's kind of like that. But I don't want to talk about it until I finished it. It's probably another couple of um, uh, another couple of uh, months off that before I think that. Um, how did I start my band? Um, 
my band was uh, uh, is a bunch of people that I really loved. I wanted to put a band together uh, and I knew I wanted to work with Owen, the producer. And uh, I thought about other people I'd like in the band. And, and uh, I think Lily's an incredible singer. So I asked her, that, that's not Lily, it's Ellen. Um, uh, asked her if she'd be interested in doing it. And she said that she was interested and I wanted a bass player. And my favorite bass player in the whole universe is this guy, Tim. Sorry, Dave, I work with this guy, Dave Marks as well, who's an incredible bass player. But my favoritest of them all was this guy, Tim. So I asked him if he'd play bass and they all said yes. And I had booked us a studio and we went and made the first record, you know. Um, do you know Captain Anderton? I'm afraid I don't know who Captain Anderton is. No. Um, Jimi Hendrix as a guest is a great idea, yeah. Uh, how to start a band. You just have to ask some people that you like. You know, that's that's it. Um, am I a fan of Guns N' Roses? Absolutely, of course. I mean, Guns N' Roses, that was my... When I was a teenager, Guns N' Roses were the best band ever. So that's what... When I grew up, I know it's hard to believe, but I used to have so long a hair that I could sit on my hair, right? If I did that, it was right down to my waist. I, long, I used to look like Axl Rose and I used to wear skin tight black jeans or leather trousers and cowboy boots on the outside and I used to draw tattoos on myself of Guns N' Roses and stuff and uh, uh, yeah I was a huge Guns N' Roses fan that was what I grew up with was Guns N' Roses and Skid Row and Motley Crue and uh, that whole that Motorhead and uh, that was my thing when I was in in my late teens I guess I was in a band called Smash Alley um, uh, you know, it was a, a, which I think was an L.A. Gun song, and we were, that, we were I was right into all of that hair metal stuff. I used to perm, well, not perm it, but you know, I can't remember what you call it. Like you brush backwards with the back combing, probably is what it's called. You know, to have a big hair. It's, I, man, I used to look like such a twat. I tell you, especially live, get, growing up in Tasmania and looking like that, it's just like, you know, definitely look like a complete tool. But uh, one day I'll get, in fact, it's on my to-do list is to go through my photos and find some of those old photos because I just look such a, such a moron. But anyway, um, so yeah, I loved all of that. And I definitely want to do some more Guns N' Roses. I think I got put off doing Guns N' Roses a little bit because there was a period where they, they pulled all of our videos. So everyone that, you know, me and Marty and everyone who had any Guns N' Roses songs, they put some, you know, they got their lawyers out and all of my Guns N' Roses videos got pulled and it caught, had a backlash on the fact that... Um, I had to be careful with you because if you get three strikes for copyright on YouTube, they pull your channel. And I didn't want to do that. So, uh, but it seems like they don't mind anymore. So maybe I'll go back and revisit, um, revisit some Guns N' Roses. I should almost certainly remake the Sweet Child of Mine, especially being that I teach it wrong. <laughs> um, I use the wrong finger. Well, wrong fingering. I use a different fingering to Slash, but Slash gets to choose the correct fingering because it's his song. So I should really do that and redo the solos. And I'd love to do that in solo in Sweet Child of Mine as well because I'd, I'd like to... Um, I'd like to learn that for myself because it's got some great licks in it. I've never, it's one, one of the rare solos that I've really wanted to learn and I'd just not done it for some reason. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'll almost certainly be revisiting Guns N' Roses soon. Uh, the next big project for me is La uh, Lady Rider, the, the Mark Knopfler song, uh, the Die Straight song. And, uh, I've nearly got that down. I, I just need maybe another one or two practice sessions on it and then, and then I'll be happy enough to, to redo that i'm redoing uh, wish you were here as well including the end solo as well which is interesting so the the, the intro riff all of the chords and the the, the solo uh, so that's the next big projects so i've got some more motorhead coming up uh this that i'll be recording lessons for this week um and a couple more bowie tunes as well so i've got a lot of lot of stuff going on at the moment I've, i'm redoing the the blues league guitar course i'm halfway through i filmed already the first half of the first new segment but i've rearranged some stuff so it's a much better course now that should be that'll be coming out soon uh God, man I'm, I'm just i'm really on it at the moment I'm, I'm i'm tearing through the lessons man i know you're not seeing a whole lot of it right now uh but it's only because i'm so into planning and organizing my stuff that i i, I want to make sure it's right and good and and works properly you know uh but yeah good good stuff coming up for this you guys you're going to be excited um uh have you ever done a lesson on using pedal points no that pedal points is kind of a, a neoclassical thing i mean i could show you one if you you know the, the, all of those are those kind of ingve licks using the a harmonic minor scale so the idea of the pedal points just coming back to the one note 
those kind of phrases. I mean, I know what they are and I've learned them in the past, but it's not, again, it's not really my bag. So I haven't, haven't got into doing that. Um, do you think guitar-based music will come back to the mainstream ever? I mean, it's kind of coming back, I think. You know, there's a lot more guitar going on than there used to be. And, uh, you know, guys like Ed Sheeran is a you know wonderful guitar player uh, doing very clever things with loopers and stuff. So I think it's coming forward again just in a different way. I think the, the idea of those big 80s rock solos and stuff, I'm not, I'm not sure that'll come back in the same way, you know. I think... Uh, it's coming back, you know, the, the the new Bowie record is as current as music is, I think. That, for me, is the cutting edge of, of, of new music. It's it's exactly where I, the type of thing that I really like, this kind of jazzy, outside, angry, a bit weird sort of stuff. That's what, personally, I, the kind of thing that turns me on musically. And I think that's the forefront. And there's a lot of guitar in that. If you listen, you know, it's not guitar right at the front, but if you listen, there's loads of wonderful um wonderful layers of textural guitar which is again that stuff that i really like um uh favorite red hot chili peppers album would have to be blood sugar um and in interestingly uh, uh, it's going to be a lot more um uh, red hot chili peppers coming up soon too as well um just because there's so many i've been mean, chatting to a few guys lately about their journey on on guitar um and and how i'd forgotten how much fun it is to play riffs you know, I, I go on about song, easy songs and jamming and all of that sort of stuff, but it's really fun to play easy riffs. And I'd kind of forgotten about that a bit, so I'm going to be doing some stuff with uh, basically some Chili Peppers uh, sort of songs, like slightly simplified for beginners, but I'll probably do the authentic versions as well. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so I'm just about, yeah, we're pretty much out of time now, guys, I'm afraid. Um, I hope you've really been enjoying this this session. I'm sorry that I didn't get to your questions. I've got a bunch of questions here that I'll, I'll try and look at. And, and you know, these, these sessions, as well as being for you and to try and help you, is also is, is about getting, you know, my finger on the pulse of what you guys want to do and, and how I can help you become better at guitar. So, um, you know, the, the questions that I get, I make notes about what the questions are. And uh, I, I, I revise the sessions when I'm editing them to think about what um, what uh, you know uh, what stuff that you want to do and, and the questions that you ask as well. Uh, before I go, I do a copy and paste of the whole question thing so I can look back at what stuff you guys are talking about and what sort of stuff that you want to do. So and and so by participating in these forums, you know, I'm I'm, I'm trying to help you shape what what I do to deliver you guys the best lessons that you can. The, you know the best stuff that you can do so that's the that's the kind of plan um so uh look you know thanks very much for coming along and being part of this thing and and uh sharing this live stream experience and um i've not been doing much playing in these i think that's one thing i'm going to change for the next week i'm going to try and make maybe i need to do a little um little performance thing at the beginning of the lessons would be good as well um yeah might do that for next week, so I'll try and do a do a little thing. So big thank you to the mods as usual. Um, that's very very cool of you. I'm not sure which mods exactly we're working today. I know it's definitely uh, Tornike from the forum. I haven't seen Magica yet, here yet today. Um, have, have you made a an appointment, uh, DJ? Um, and I, I think Liev and ZV's been around. I think I saw his name around and close to you definitely as well. Thanks, uh, guys. Never sure whether to use your proper names because I know you personally, or whether you prefer to use your screen names. Um, really uh, helpful, and especially doing this copying and pasting into that document thing, guys. That was a, a really good idea. So, look, thank you all so much for coming along, um, and uh, I'll see hopefully all of you again. I'm definitely back again next week. Uh, I'll put the invites up and ar around soon, um, and uh, yeah. Keep the questions coming. Think about your questions a bit beforehand if you want so we can get some stuff. And I, I am checking out the questions that people leave on the Facebook page as well. So that the Facebook's a good place to do that. And, and the forum as well. We've got a thread specifically for the for the live stream so you can put suggestions for what you'd like to see there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm open to this thing being malleable and, and, and uh, becoming... Uh, you know, becoming something that we all share as, as, as helping all of us help me make the site better for you and make it better for you. So we all win. Um, so have yourselves a wonderful rest of your weekend. I better get home. I'm really hungry, actually. So um, 
Uh, not sure what's on for dinner today. Uh, funnily enough, my, my missus dropped in on the live stream. I don't know how many of you remember last time there was somebody asking what was for dinner. It was my missus. <laughs> That's quite funny. It's like, I thought she was cooking dinner, but she wasn't. Um, anyway, it's kind of funny. Well, I thought it was funny. So anyway, have yourselves a lovely time. Have a great rest of your weekend. And uh, I'll see you for plenty more stuff very soon. Lots of exciting things in the works going on, guys. So uh, take care of yourselves and I'll see you soon. Bye bye.